Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we discuss scotch, the history, what it's made from, the different types you can buy, and anything else you always wanted to know about scotch. <laughs> To learn how to taste scotch or host a whiskey tasting, please check out this video here. The first mention of scotch can be dated back to June 1st, 1495 to the Exchequer Rolls of Scotland. Thereafter, whiskey began to circulate throughout the country and by 1644 it was now taxed. Of course, there were some smart distillers who sold it illegally and it became only more popular after that. By 1780, there were only eight legal distilleries in Scotland who had to compete against over 400 bootlegging operations. The popularity of whiskey swelled again in 1831 when the column still took off. Now, distilleries were able to mass produce a spirit at a much lower cost with a better quality. However, it wasn't until 1880 that scotch would become a global phenomenon. Up until then, wine and brandy had the top spots of drinks in the world. Interestingly, a very small microscopic insect killed a lot of the grapes, and so there was a huge demand for a new beverage. The Philoxera bug brought the wine and brandy production almost to an immediate halt, and scotch put pick up where they left off. Today, scotch is enjoyed by many gentlemen around the world. Unfortunately, the terms are often mixed up, and so we'll try to provide some clarity. Probably the most popular Scotch term is single malt. That means it is a whiskey from a single Scottish distillery that is based on barley and water. It contains no other cereals and must be distilled and bottled in Scotland. Next up is the category of single grain Scotch whiskey, which usually you can't find easily on liquor store shelves in the US. Just like the single malt, the single grain whiskey starts out with barley and water, but then other things are added to the mash, which start the fermentation and eventually end up in alcohol. Just like a single malt, it has to be bottled in Scotland to be named Scotch. So single grain Scotch whiskey is what you find for the most part in blended whiskeys out there. So what is the term? blended scotch means basically you need at least one single malt scotch that is then paired with at least one single grain scotch. You may have come across the term blended malt scotch which is rather uncommon and previously was also referred to as vetted malt or pure malt. You get a blended malt scotch if you take at least two single malt scotches from different distilleries and blend them together. So blended grain scotch is very similar it just means that you have at least two or more single grain scotches that are then blended together. What about the term double malt scotch? Chances are you've come across a term when in fact it's not even a legal definition. So one could say that a double malt scotch doesn't actually exist. So if you ever come across a bottle that says double malt or triple malt, it means that the scotch was aged in either two different barrels or three different barrels. The proper term for this would be double wood or triple wood. Sometimes you can also find terms like double cask matured or anything that's similar to that. The process of aging scotch in different casks and barrels is very common, but nevertheless, it still remains a single malt whiskey. So what needs to be in a scotch in order to be able to call it a scotch? Again, it must be produced, bottled, and distilled in Scotland, it must be based on barley and water, and must be aged in casks. Yes, whole grains and other cereal can be added to the malted barley mash in order to produce different flavor varieties. It also has to be processed entirely at a distillery. It has to be fermented with enzymes and yeast, and the alcoholic strength can't be more than 94.8% or 190 proof. It has to be matured in a warehouse in Scotland, and it can't be larger than 700 liters. That's about 185 US gallons. In order to call it scotch, it has to stay there for at least three full years. If you don't call it scotch, you must retain the color, aroma, and flavor of the raw ingredients. It must not contain any other substances other than water to water it down to bring it to a certain proof level, and E-150A, which is caramel coloring. 
Last but not least, you can't water down too much. It must retain at least 40% or 80 proof for it to be called scotch. So what about the production of scotch? Just like other spirits, it all starts with water. And in Scotland, they're known for the particularly pure, soft water that is very low on mineral contents, which allows for a great scotch. And because of that, most distilleries are usually very close to a good water source. Now, the distilleries at the west coast of Scotland have a slightly different water, which results into a different aroma. The so-called peat bogs influence the flavor, which is also known as peat. So bogs are as much as wetlands, and peat is fermented plant matter that gives a certain taste that is hard to describe, and it's truly something you have to drink so you can appreciate, and either you like it or not but at least you have to taste it. Today, the majority of barley in the world comes from Scotland, so it makes sense to use that local grain to keep costs down. So how do you get from barley to malted barley? First, you add the barley grain to the water. When the grains are soaked in water, it causes the starch to be transformed into a sugar called maltose. This sugar, in turn, feeds a process called the germination. Over the next six days, little shoots begin to sprout from the barley which is a sign for a distiller that the barley can now be dried. This either happens with hot air or with peat smoke. The drying prevents the barley from sprouting or growing further, and it prevents them from rotting. Now that the barley is properly malted, it is ground up into a substance that is similar to a flour. At this stage, hot water is added to the malted barley, and it turns it into a mash. This is usually done in big mash tons, and the purpose is to remove the sugar from the grains, which is then in turn used in the next step of the fermentation. During the fermentation, yeast consumes the sugar and in turn produces alcohol. However, at a certain level, the yeast produces so much alcohol that it kills itself. In order to get a spirit with a higher proof, it needs to be distilled. Usually the mixture is distilled at least two or three times, which produces a high alcohol content. If you want to learn more details about this process, please check out our in-depth scotch guide on our website here. Now, the regions of Scotland are very important. There are five regions, each of them known for a specific flavor profile. There's the Highlands, the Lowlands, Speyside, Campbellton, and Isla. For example, the Highlands are known for their medium-bodied whiskies. They're typically lighter and some say more luxurious than, let's say, the whiskies from Isla. At the same time, they're stronger than the whiskies you typically get from the lowlands. The lowlands are known for their lighter and more delicate whiskies, and usually you don't find peat in them. So if you're not a fan of peat, the lowlands are good for you. Some would argue that you can find the most elegant and refined whiskies in Scotland in Speyside, which is also home to the most distilleries in Scotland today. The majority of the whiskies of Campbell are aged about 10 years, and there are only three distilleries left today. Isla, spelled I-S-L-A-Y, are the heavy hitters of Scotch whiskies. These spirits are often heavily peated. Some would even say they feel oily when you drink them, and others even compare them to iodine. So how should you taste scotch? Of course, you can drink it in any way you want, but there are a few traditional ways. If you just want to savor scotch, it's best not to blend it in mixed drinks or cocktails. Also, you need the right glass. Basically, there's a stemmed capita glass as well as a Glencarine glass, and you can learn more about them in our scotch tasting video here. Some argue that the stemmed glass is better because it doesn't heat up the whiskey as much, and you also don't have any off flavors from your hand. Personally, I find the shorter stemmed glass much more practical because I've never experienced it heating up my whiskey and you can easily wash it in the dishwasher. So how exactly should you drink scotch? Neat, with water, or with ice? I answer all of those questions in our scotch tasting video here. So what scotch bottles do we recommend? Honestly, my personal tastes change over time, but we put a list together on our website that is constantly updated. If you want to read some tasting notes, along with a specific rating and a value for the money explanation, I suggest you check out whiskeymusings.com and Matt, who runs that blog, has tasted over a thousand whiskeys. He owns several hundred bottles and he's a true connoisseur of Scotch whiskey. 
and it can help you to figure out if a whiskey that you like maybe had others that go in the same vein. And that way you don't have to spend so much money to find others that really work for you. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to our channel, hit that little bell, and videos like this will come right to your inbox. In today's video, I'm wearing a blazer combination, which consists of a lighter shade of navy double-breasted blazer in a very fine Vitale Barberis Canonico fabric. I'm pairing it with a black and white houndstooth pair of slacks, and my shirt is blue and white striped with double cuffs. They're closed with green and silver malachite cufflinks from Fort Belvedere that match the green and silver malachite ring on my pinky finger. Instead of a pocket square, I opted for a little lapel flower, which you can find in our shop, as well as all the other accessories seen here. My tie is likewise from Fort Belvedere. It comes in an olive green and it harmonizes with my shoes, which are also olive green. My socks are gray with clocks in white and black, which tie together the black and white houndstooth pants with my shoes. <laughs> Thank you.